thrilled to present Chant Ekri. He is a senior project manager at Impact 7G Sustainable Environmental Solutions. This is a nationwide company that offers clients data-driven solutions ranging from telecommunications environmental services, you'll have to tell me what that is, um, health and safety compliance, natural resource restoration, and clean water initiatives. Chance program Rain Gardens Enhance the Environment addresses creating practical and beautiful rain gardens for your landscapes that catches and filters rainwater runoff using native plants. Uh, his discussion reveals how to provide food and shelter for butterflies, songbirds, and other wildlife. You can see that that's important from the stats that we had at the last presentation. presenter. Oops, I touched that, sorry. Um, he's passionate about restoring natural areas and native habitats in the Midwest. He provides evaluations of forest, riparian, wetland, and prairie habitats that are backed with experience in restoring and managing these areas with a focus on habitat and sustainability. Chant employs an array of collaborative and technical expertise in team and project management, util utilizing GIS and information architecture tool, tool sets, while focusing on assessments and communication of environmental concepts. He's a prescribed fire manager and burn boss, I love that title, who executes restoration tools to benefit and aid clients, natural areas, communities, and leads restoration in prescribed fire services. He's also a certified professional wetland scientist with a diverse and in-depth experience in natural resource identification, management, analysis, and regulation. Chance professional experience collaborating with private stakeholders, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations has served his work in the environmental consulting arena for nearly two decades in Johnson County. He has a BA in Environmental Studies from the University of Oregon. Please welcome Chant. Thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, there's, we cover quite a bit um, as environmental consultants, Impact 7G, as she mentioned, everything from telecom to, to rain gardens. Um, so my little niche that I'm going to kind of focus on today um, is, of course, rain gardens and native plants. And I, and I wanted to put this slide up just to kind of give, give you all kind of a sense of where I'm coming from in this discussion. Um, you know, doing so, so I got into the environmental consulting realm primarily through wetland work, uh, identifying wetlands, um, working with uh, entities to find ways to uh, mitigate wetlands, create wetlands. Um, you work with municipalities, developers, um, that sort of thing. And what we found is that when we would, when we would restore or enhance wetland areas, um, there was not much uh, knowledge out, out there about the, the, the practical aspects of, of establishing natives in these areas. Um, so, so we got into the, into the realm of actually doing some of the restoration work, um, working specifically with, with native species, with native plants in, in wetland and riparian areas. So that's kind of the, kind of the technical background, and, and I threw this example up. This is actually in Coralville. Um, this is Clear Creek Trail right there. This is south of Foster Road. Um, and this is a really beautiful wetland complex. It actually is essentially a rain garden for the Coral Ridge Mall um, because all of the drainage that comes off all of those parking lots goes down that high flow bypass, that channel, used to be the channel that would dump it straight into Clear, Clear Creek right down here. So we built this, this wetland complex to, to funnel off most of the flow into that area during just normal, uh, normal periods where it gets filtered through plants and trees and, and all that good stuff. So, um, so that's kind of where I come to it from. Um, you know, as, as an entity, our, our natural areas restoration services are more focused on um, helping people with their natural areas, helping manage their prairie establishment, their woodlands, 
Um, and then also identify stormwater best practices, which is where rain gardens come in, um, as well as planning and management and design of these larger areas. So let's jump into it. Um, you know, wanted a couple, I want to touch on some basic considerations here. Um, you know, what, what about rain gardens can we employ in our yards to just to make a beautiful landscape and take advantage of, of, the, of the plentiful resource that is the rain during most, m most years? Um, I'll talk about building a case for native plants, which Natalie already did a great job of uh, starting that for, for me. Um, talk a little bit about source, sourcing plants and, and, and buzz through some of my personal favorites because that's what we all really want to see. We want to see just those little, uh, you know, things like seed box. What a wonderful plant. Um, so cool, so underrated. It's a wetland plant. Um, you know, there's so many, so many neat little plants that you can use for all these various, various things and, and, and as, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, there's so many out there, so many op options. Uh, and, then, and then we'll just kind of run through some quick design considerations for rain gardens. So what is a rain garden? Well, stepping back, um, it's, it's what's considered a stormwater BMP, which is a best management practice. Um, these include you know, things like rain gardens and bioswales, previous paving, native planting, um, green roofs, soil quality restoration, which is improving your turf grass essentially, um, the, the soil infiltration, um, and rainwater capture. But the way I like to think of it, especially in, the term, in terms of rain gardens and bioswales and our, and our local landscape, really we're trying to turn pollution into a resource. Um, now, why is rainwater a pollution? Why is it a pollutant? It's not, it's a conveyor of pollutants, and it's actually one of the biggest ones. Um, you don't think of rainwater as polluting our rivers, but it is. It's landing on our houses, it's flowing into the street, it's picking up all the hydrocarbons, all of the junk, all of the fertilizers from our, from our yards, um, herbicides, all that stuff gets picked up and conveyed into our waterways. So we're taking something, we're taking this amazing resource and we're allowing it to be a pollutant. So how can we turn that into a resource? So here's a, here's a practical example, rain gardens. Um, this is a rain garden here in Iowa City um, in my backyard and my neighbor's backyard. Uh, we combined to create a 2000 or 200 square foot rain garden and I did some quick calcs uh, and since we built that in 2009, uh, it has infiltrated 642,921 gallons of water. That's how much water it's kept out of the storm sewer. So it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, 40 to 50,000 gallons a year. Uh, and what do I get? I get a nice, well, I'll show you pictures of it. It's a, it's a nice urban area. So what again, it kind of makes a rain garden? Well, it's the directing of rainwater runoff from impervious surfaces, and this could be your roof, this could be your driveway, this could be parking lots, into, into essentially an area where we can grow plants. And I like to throw the rain, rain barrel in there because you might as well intercept it on the way and then you've got some good uh, watering. So there's basically a, just a couple of rules. Raiden gardens really aren't that complicated. It's easy to make them over, overly complicated. They're really not that complicated. It's not a water feature, it's not a pond. As a matter of fact, you really shouldn't have more than a few hours of standing water in it. If it's de designed well, it will suck that water down into the ground and will be essentially dry after that. Um, there is a minimum size calculation. You don't wanna funnel a huge amount of water into a small area, of course, um, and it's not, it's not that complicated. But really, there's no real max, maximum size. I mean, it's, we can always go out there and water it with our hose if we're worried about it, but if we're using the right plants, they're gonna be pulling water from the ground. Um, and so there really is no maximum size per se. Um, and a, a really kind of key thing to factor into all this is soil percolation rates, which I'll get into a little bit more towards the end. Um, you know, we need to, we want to, 
um, infiltrate uh, that water into the, through the ground. And, and if we have soil that can, that can do that, then we don't need to amend it. And we don't need to put things like subdrains and these kind of engineered solutions they really are un un unnecessary in a lot of circumstances. Some circumstances they are. Um, so, and of course, always provide an overflow. Um, again, it's one of those kind of key things. Um, we design them for a certain size rain event, which covers 90% of all rain events, but we still get that three or four inch rain on occasion. And so be ready for where that water is gonna go and what potential damage it can cause, honestly. So those are kind of the real basics that you really got to consider. So a few examples. Um, again, these, this, these are all variations on a theme. You know, you take water um, from a source, a roof, a driveway, a parking lot, um, or even a steep or poorly drained yard can be a water source. And you channel it to any vegetated space designed to hold or detain that water briefly. So this can be wildflower or landscape plantings. Um, it can be curb cuts. It can be a shrub feature. I like this. I mean, this is a very simple, um, it's just a depression that's next to a house and you've got a couple of shrubs in there. It's, and you've got a perfectly fine feature here that probably nobody looking at it would ever even think that it was a rain garden. Um, but it's doing that, it's infiltrating that water and feeding, feeding those plants. Very simple. Um, uh, here's, a, here's an example of a shady ditch rain garden. Um, I'm not a huge fan of hostas because there are uh, alternatives, but hostas do grow well in shade and in harsh environments. And so uh, here's, a, you can just tuck it in along the edge of a, a, of a roadway here and you can see hostas doing a great job right there. Um, a simple yard feature um, with a little bit of landscaping. Uh, again, you see a downspout going to a little, you know, probably, you know, 75 square foot, foot area. And then within, you know, a year's time, you've got this lush space. Curb cuts are a little bit more technical, of course. Um, but, you know, this is another great place. This, this one on the, on the, on the left is uh, at Forever Green Nursery here in uh, Johnson County. Um, and you can see they've done a really nice job of designing that. Here's a simpler one right in somebody's front yard. Now they literally cut the curb and put a, put a depression to catch some of that water. A um, Couple of little planting tips for, for these types of things. Use warm season plants, because when the winter, uh, when all the salt from all the winter is there, uh, it will give a chance for the salt to kind of dissipate or soak in before the warm season plants uh, start to grow. Uh, so giving them a chance, um, or use salt tolerant cool season plants. Um, so another place where natives can come in handy. So a multi-house feature, again, this was the one that we put in, in my backyard. Um, 200 square feet, um, and right off the bat, it's, you know, we've got some live plants in there. We were able to find some fairly large stock, so we got an immediate um, establishment, and boom, a year, year later, we've got a really nice, lush landscape. Here's another example. Um, this was outside of our office in Coralville. Um, and it's, again, it's one that you wouldn't think, okay, yeah, there's a rain, rain barrel there, um, but you wouldn't necessarily think that this is a, a, a rain garden, perhaps. But if you take a closer look, you've got both the rainwater coming in from the roof, and then you've got another inlet coming off of the, um, off of the parking lot here. So, um, and this is an, is, this is an interesting one because it kind of defies the standard depressional approach. Um, but again, shows that variation of a theme. What we, what we did here is um, you can see the, wa the, 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 the water goes into the rain barrel, and then if you look to the right of the rain barrel, there's a, a little overflow. And what that does is it goes down into a gravel trench that is just below the surface in this area. So the idea is we're not flooding the surface, we're actually delivering the water directly to the roots and giving it a place to disperse. It's 
So we don't have, we never have surface water in this one. And then there's basically a, a kind of a curb cut, if you will, but really it's just, you know, a break in the limestone edging. And what we did here is we put a catchment basin in so that the, the junk that's coming off, the, off of the um, parking lot would get filtered out before, again, it just kind of goes into the, over, the basin, overflows into kind of a subspace in that rain garden area. So it promotes a beautiful, healthy landscape. We don't have to wa water it as much. The soils on this one weren't quite as bad as the clay soils we heard about at the, uh, at the earlier presentation, but um, uh, they were pretty rough. Uh, and those plants do just fine. Here's another set of examples. These are kind of your more traditional rain gardens that you see. Um, this is directly from the Rain Gardens of Iowa uh, manual uh, from Rainscaping Iowa, which is a great resource. Um, you'll notice that uh, Johnson County has some pretty good representation here with the Iowa City Fire Station, the Coralville Fire Station, uh, the same Forever Green one that I had. Um, so yeah, you can see variations on, on the theme here. So, you know, one of the things that I like to, you know, bring up is, you know, the, there's a balance of site objectives. And again, consider this from my background. I'm not a landscape architect. Um, I'm coming to it from kind of almost a regulatory background where we were building natural spaces to mitigate the loss of other natural spaces. So it's on a kind of a larger uh, context. And we also work with larger stormwater um, uh, context as well. Um, so when you're looking at smaller gardens, rain gardens, there's more of a focus on look and composition, uh, bloom times, plant height. It's a little bit more intensive maintenance, um, and it's more the landscape context is, is key. Um, but really, you can think of rain gardens in a larger context as well, um, in, the, in the best management practices context, where it's more of a focus on function. Um, in these larger areas, essentially it's, it's still a rain garden, um, but you might be more concerned about the hydrology, and you have opportunities to do zonation here. You might actually have a ponding area and kind of a, and kind of a, a bench area where you can have different types of plantings. Um, and, and you really need to think more about conditions and environmental tolerances in these circumstances. So, I know Natalie did a great job already building a case for natives, and I'm just going to come in and, and support that even more. So what I like to do is I call it the native advantage that we have with these plants. Um, they're locally adapted. So right off the bat, I mean, they are locally adapted to, to our soils, to our weather, our, our climactic conditions. They're disease resistant, they're pest resistant, um, they're disturbance resistant. Um, yeah, the deer love them. They eat my New England asters back to nubs every year, but they spring back because they've got that advantage. Um, and longevity, they stick around and they grow. And as a matter of fact, they can be kind of weedy. I've got, I've got iron, um, ironweed and black-eyed Susans popping up in my turf grass all the time. And, you know, and I'll like kind of mow around it a little bit. And it's great when it's a really dry summer because I'll have ironweed popping out of my lawn. My lawn doesn't grow like at all, so I don't mow it for two months. And I'll have ironweed popping out of it. And of course, I love it. Um, my neighbors, yeah, maybe not so much. Um, but, you know, native plants have beneficial microbial activity. Um, that, that uh, makes them more effective um, in the environment. Um, they outcompete weeds. They, they do well in, lo in low nutrient soils. Diverse assemblages fill ecological niches. This, it's more than, when you want to talk about competing with weeds, it's more than just cover. They're, they're, they're filling the, the niches. They're, if there's an ex excess of a nutrient, um, the, the, you know, the, the, the native species plants that need that nutrient will move in and take over if you've got a diverse assemblage um, before, the, before the weeds do. Um, 
and, uh, and integrated pest management. Uh, one of my favorite analogies is, you know, um, um, Canadian thistle um, actually uh, promotes certain, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the, the specific insect now, uh, but anyway, the native thistles, our native prairie thistles, actually promote the natural um, competitors of certain um, weed species, weed insects that we have um, that, that the Canadian thistle um, does not support, does not support those competitors. So, so again, it's a complex system. Uh, the environment is very complex. You, you've got things like um, barberry and honeysuckle bushes, which are non-native species that um, deer ticks thrive on. And the establishment of these invasive species in our woodlands allows for the, for the, for the establishment of more deer tick populations. Whereas the native, the native species promote the native predators of deer ticks. Um, so, so you can see how that kind of integrated uh, uh, pest management occurs in the environment that we can now promote. And of course, there's long-term maintenance savings um, as well, uh, because once these areas are established, they pretty much take care of themselves. You just have to keep them looking pretty. So, and of course, there's wildlife habitat value. Um, there's, this is more for larger sites, but surface roughness is an important component when it comes to water quality, because it slows the water down, giving an opportunity to infiltrate. So you can see on the, on the left, a, the water just shoots right through there, um, not so much on the right. There's an actual channel on the right. You can't even see it. And of course, we've all seen slides like this. Um, the deep roots of native plants help condition the soil. They literally inject organic matter deep into that soil um, by growing and dying and, and regenerating. They increase. This, this breaks up the soil, it increases the infiltration, it builds soil structure, um, and all these things help with water quality in a big way. And of course, resiliency in a changing climate. Uh, my turf grass doesn't like droughts, but the ironweed, it's fine with it. More biomass and assemblages. Um, this, again, helps with water uptake. One of the things that I found amazing about my own personal rain garden, you saw that one of those, that picture where it was pretty, you know, uh, pretty big and, and full of a lot of plants. The amount of water that that tissue literally holds during, you know, directly after a rain event is phenomenal. Um, so, and that tissue is also holding water down below the surface as well. So it's not just moving water into the soil, it's literally moving the water into the plants themselves. And of course, there's nutrient benefits that go along with that and pollutant trapping in that vegetative matter. matter. And, you know, and then of course, it's just, it's beautiful. Innate weed su suppression, and when, you, when, you, when it fills in um, with all the plants, especially when you have a native assemblage like this, um, there's, there's no need for mulch. So take the long view, a little extra work early on in the design and the maintenance um, uh, will save you a lot of effort uh, over the long term. All right, so let's talk about plants. That's why everybody's here, right? We want to we want to talk about plants. So I got, so it's a it's a swamp, right? So where are all the cattails? Um, this is this is one of my favorite uh, pictures because this is a this is a wetland mitigation site actually in Cedar Rapids, and 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 what's and and I'm a wetland scientist, and I work in wetlands all the time, and there's always trash in them. So there's something about the trash can being in the wetland that I think is just too appropriate. Um, so rain gardens are dry features most of the time. Um, so they are not swamp features, they are not ponds. Um, really, um, if it's designed correctly, the, the water should not be standing in there for more than 12, 12 hours. And I think that's really important because when rain gardens were first kind of being talked about, a lot of people thought, well, this is going to be a pond sort of water feature. 
It's absolutely not. One of, the, one of the tools that I find handy is the uh, wetland status indicator for, for Midwest region. Um, and um, you, can, you can Google a plant name and, and with wetland status indicator, and it'll tell you uh, where it fits on the range from obligate, which is basically plants that you pretty much only find um, in wetland areas um, through facultative wet, facultative, which is right in the middle, facultative upland, and all the way to upland. Um, now this isn't, a, this, this isn't, it doesn't tell you um, everything about a plant, as you'll see in some of my plant suggestions, um, but it gives you kind of a ballpark, um, and, and you can find that for, for most uh, species. Um, and you can compare that to your particular site. Um, so it's not a definitive, uh, you know, resource, but it's a good guide uh, to understanding what plants will do well. Um, and, and really, and I should say, um, for a rain garden, you typically want facultative, something in the middle. Um, yeah. So sourcing and plant selection, let's talk about seed mixes, which I do like to use seed mixes, even on rain gardens, um, along with other, uh, with other plants. Um, so you've got to make sure you have a reputable, established supplier. Seed mixes do go bad. They really, they don't have a great shelf life. Um, so if it's more than a year old, you shouldn't be paying much for it. Um, you should have one from last year's harvest. Um, you know, find something that's locally sourced. That wildflower packet that you get in the mail from New England is not what you want to plant. Um, I, you know, people can get hyper-focused on, on, you know, on local um, ecotype. I like to think of it as more of an eco-region importance, especially with the movement of our zones. Um, but the closer you have to home, the more adapted that those species are going to be to your particular um, environment. Live plants, if you're using plugs, I like to hardy them first. And by that, I mean just grow them out a little bit. Um, I tend to work on larger sites where they don't get a whole lot of babysitting. And especially in a rain garden environment where you've got potentially flushes of water hitting it, that's a, that's a disturbance environment. So, you know, if you can't hardy them by maybe growing them a little bit larger before putting them in the ground, well, then consider taking the, uh, the water offline in your rain garden for the first few months and just babysit them a little. Um, I do like to use one gallon size uh, live plants um, because again, this is a, it's a bit of a harsher environment uh, in, in here. And try to avoid native R's. I know we love the, the beautiful br deep purple and red bergamot. I mean, it's gorgeous, but they really just don't do very well over, over time. And, and some of them, you know, Joe Pye is one of my favorite, favorites. There's a, there's a gazillion versions of that. Try to get the local ones because that's what the insects will, will like the most. That's what the moths and butterflies will, that are local to our region will like the most. It's just overall better for habitat. As far as shrubs and trees, think about um, root pruned, uh, air pruned rootstock. Um, and I like to go with kind of the Goldilocks zone of size, which is not, not too small. That, that, that are really, you know, um, um, susceptible and not too big, which are really expensive. Just get something that's, that's a good in-between size, good price, and can, and can tolerate um, the, the, envir the environmental changes. So what are some good resources um, for native, uh, for finding this information about these plants? Um, the Iowa Rain Garden Manual, Appendix A, is a great resource. They've got um, many of Iowa's most commonly used um, rain, garden, rain garden species and some really good information on there. Again, do a web search for Iowa Rain Garden Manual and it'll pop right up. Um, Prairie Moon, uh, which is based out of southern Minnesota, and, but actually a lot of their seed stock came from the Coralville Reservoir area originally. They have some really great resources and and I like Prairie Moon because they make this information available um, in a really digestible fashion for folks. 
Um, they've got a beautifully formatted PDF guide, and they've got some great Excel versions <coughs> for you to kind of build your own kind of uh, mix, if you will. And when it comes to uh, plug stock, it's the best plug stock I've, I've been able to get on the retail level. Um, so Prairie Moon's definitely a great resource. USD pl USDA Plants Database, um, that's a good way. If you're not sure if a plant is native to this area, you know, do a search um, for the plant in this database and you'll get a nice little map. The green is the native areas. So this is for pale purple coneflower and you can see right there it's native to Iowa. All right, so some of my favorite plants, um, seed box, it's kind of a wet one. Um, you need to keep it in, in, in wet areas. Um, and, but it's a gorgeous, like, little nondescript seed that has great, or plant that has uh, beautiful reds and oranges in the fall. Uh, rose or swamp milkweed um, is an excellent one, three to four feet in height. Again, it likes wet wets, uh, habitat, but really it uh, thrives well in a very wide range of conditions. I've got it in the top of my um, garden in the back of my yard where it's about as dry as it can be, and it, and it does gangbusters. Um, Landsleaf coreopsis is a nice, short, uh, kind of alternative to a black-eyed Susan's uh, for another nice yellow one. Um, handles period periodic wetness well. Um, though it is an upland plant. Hop sedge um, is one of my favorites, and one of the things that I like to recommend to folks, if you're worried about weeds in your, in your rain garden, use sedges instead of grasses. And sedges have edges, so it's, they're easy to find. But the weeds in your rain garden are often going to be grasses, and so if you're worried about it, turf grass infiltration or other kind of grasses in there, just use sedges. And then it's easy to discover what you just basically eliminate the grasses um, from it. And that actually works pretty well. Um, bergamot, again, beware the, uh, the native Rs. Um, lobelias are another favorite. Um, they do need to be kept wet, however, um, but they do really well uh, in, in, in a great habitat if, they, if you have a wet enough area. Boneset is a favorite. Um, Boneset handles a wide range of conditions and has a really unique look. Their flowers last for a long time. Vervain is often kind of underrated because their flowers aren't particularly showy, but it's a really important pollinator um, plant. Um, it play, it's a host plant for many butterflies and moths and doesn't get too big. Brown-eyed Susans, of course, are great. Um, they can be uh, kind of aggressive early on um, if you plant them in a seed mix. Um, so I actually, when I'm planting prairies, <clears throat> about the time the black-eyed Susans are really starting to come into full show, I go out there and mow it. Um, and that's because they'll come back, um, but they might actually like shade out some of the slower growing natives. Canada anemone uh, does really well in, in uh, semi-shady environments. Uh, New England aster, the deer love this one, uh, and it's a beautiful, uh, <laughs> but it comes back, um, and it's a beautiful late season color. It often blooms twice in my yard, usually early summer and again in the fall, depending on if the deer get to it. Joe pie weed, and I chuckle because a lot of these native plants are called weed because they were, you know, agricultural weeds to folks, um, but Joe pie weed is another really important pollinator plant does well in a huge, it's an obligate wetland status plant, but it does well in, in dry conditions as well. It, and it does spread. <laughs> hey, I, I like it where it is. It's taken over. You know, and the other thing with uh, Joe Pye, there are a ton of varietals out there. So that's another one where I recommend, you know, trying to find the local ecotype. Obedient plant. Um, is just gorgeous. It's got these amazing purple spikes. Um, sneezeweed, an, a very unfortunate name for a, for a beautiful plant that has just hundreds of these button-like flowers. Um, it's much underrated, it's, and it has these neat, unique uh, winged stems to it, um, and it does not make you sneeze.
the ragweed does that. Um, and a sysop, another favorite. My son and I love to go out and just like break off the little chunks of leaves and you can see that they're, these have been um, browsed by the humans. It can be finicky and will disappear for a little while, but it'll come back um, typically. Um, shady plants, there's, there, you know, these are much more difficult in, um, to establish um, in, because, in, in rain garden environments because you've got this um, influx of water and, and these just grow slower. Um, but there are some really good uh, plants out there. Virginia waterleaf is one of my favorites. It's very underrated. Um, it grows in the woods all over the place. It's got these neat little flowers um, and it has this kind of, this, these white kind of models on its leaves that looks like water um, and it persists all year long. Um, Bloodroot, wild ginger, wild geranium, these all do really well. Um, and of course, bluebells and even Ohio sp spiderwort. Um, you know, you, if, you're, if you're doing a shady rain garden, um, you know, you, you kind of have to be resigned to have something probably a little bit more like what's in this bottom picture, um, if it's a really deep shaded area. Uh, but with a little tending care, you can get some of these to, to fill in that space pretty well. Be careful of plants that need to be wet all the time. As I mentioned, we don't put cattails in rain gardens, they just don't survive. Rushes and bulrushes, I love them, but they just don't do well. Um, pickerel, weed, and arrowhead, again, these are pond plants. Um, aggressive natives we have to be careful of. Uh, germander is, is kind of a nondescript one, and it'll take over everywhere. Um, and then cup plant is another one that is quite aggressive, um, and we'll you know, just keep that out of the rain garden because you'll have nothing but cup plant very quickly. Um, Floppy tall plants, I love them, but most of these rain garden spaces just aren't big enough. And, and that's kind of one of the, of, of our native planted landscapes. That's one of those things that people, I think, associate with them is like the grasses and the prairie coreopsis all flopped over onto the sidewalk or, you know, wherever. So either put them inside of a larger space or just make sure to keep them out. Ironweed is one of my favorites, but it can be, it can be floppy. Um, and then, of course, plants like Rattlesnake Master, you know, are really cool and, and might do well for a year or two, but then you'll have just a stretch of like, you know, six weeks of consistent, you know, rains and they'll just croak because they just don't like being, having their feet wet that long. So max out the benefits, use native species, put as much diversity in there as possible, um, add season long blooms, so that, those, so that those pollinators are getting um, all, all sorts of opportunities. Um, and there's some, you know, a couple of neat resources out there for kind of learning about what plants um, can support habitat in, in your area. Um, so finally, I'll kind of wrap things up with some design considerations. How am I doing on time, Linda? Okay. Um, so, you know, this, this is kind of the go-to, and we're really lucky in Iowa to have this, um, the, the Iowa Rain Garden Design and Installation Manual. Um, they've got some great tutorials in here for you know, site evaluation, plant selection, and even cost uh, budgeting. Um, and, and, it kinda, and, it, and it gets thorough, and, it, and I would even say overly thorough in, in some areas, because again, these rain gardens aren't that complicated. You just need to keep the, the kind of the basics in mind. Um, and, you know, a couple of rule of thumbs to keep in mind, all right? About 10% of the drainage area is, is the size of your garden. So if you think back to the, the picture of my house, we had about 2,000 square feet draining into it. It was about a 200 square foot drainage area. Just a rule of thumb, there are calculations to help you more precisely design that, but um, it's good to have a sense of what you're, of what you're dealing with. Um, these size calculations are based on one and a quarter rain events because that is 90% of the rain events that happen in our state. So that's kind of a good place to, um, to design to. And you, that's your minimum, right? But you've got to always, always consider overflow. Um, you know, where is it going to go? Where's the low spot? 
If you've got, if it's all inside of a berm, it's going to overtop the berm at some point and might cause erosional issues, or it might be going directly towards your neighbor's, uh, you know, um, window well, or you know that sort of thing. You've got to keep in mind um, where the water is going to go when it maxes out its capacity, um, and you might have to consider putting a, basically a standpipe in there uh, somewhere for the water to escape. Also, keep in mind proximity to buildings. Keep it 10 feet away. You know, be considerate um, of your neighbors. Uh, you know, they'll have questions. Uh, you know, when we were putting, our, you know, uh, one rain garden in, you know, the neighbors were asking, and they had their, they, they had their, their uh, garden was just across the fence, and they were concerned that we were going to be um, basically flooding out their garden. So we had a conversation, and, and I didn't point out to them that the walnut tree was or that overhung their garden was probably more of a problem than our rain garden. That being said, um, they were very informed and afterwards, and, they, and, and I, I told them that, you know, this will probably actually help dry out your garden because we're kind of creating a depression here that will pull the water into it in most rain events. So it was good. And then, of course, we got our neighbors on board and actually combined, um, you know, our rain gardens with their house, and that was really exciting. Um, and just made for a great uh, experience. Keep in mind water sources and conveyance, of course, where's the water coming from? Um, again, this is our house and our neighbor's house. There's a 6% grade kind of rule of thumb. You need to be able to keep that consistent drop at about 6%, otherwise you don't want to have these, air, these low spots in your drainage where mosquitoes are going to get in there and breed and, and that sort of thing. You got to keep the water flowing. So in this case, there was a lot of uh, corrugated tubing that went into the ground and a fair amount of trenching. Um, don't ever use perforated tubing. Always use solid tubing. Um, and so, yeah, uh, once you get the water kind of in the right spot, um, a couple other kind of key things to remember is, the, the, is we're not creating a water conveyance feature here. We're creating a garden. Um, that is meant to hold the water. So the bottom needs to be flat, and typically, you know, this is, uh, you know, installed in, in an area that has a low slope, and then that's perfect because then you can take kind of the, the dirt from the, from the top of the slope and, and make a berm at the bottom of the slope, um, and you can kind of fit this into your landscape. And here you can see in ours, you know, we, we dug it out, and, and we actually put a retaining wall along the back um, again, to just kind of make sure, it, it, and almost we were able to waste the extra dirt on that kind of berm on the backside, but then it also gave our neighbor that a little extra um, reassurance um, that, that he wasn't going to get flooded out. So a perk test is, is a really key and fairly basic um, thing that, that anyone can do, and this is how you determine the drainage that are, is existing in the location where you want to put your rain garden. Um, so really, and there's, there's instructions in the rain garden manual, but really you dig a hole, you saturate it with water for an hour or two, and then you just measure how fast the water drops. And that is telling you the percolation rate or how much the water is moving through the soil in that area. So you want to have an area that has at least a half inch per hour uh, percolation rate. And and if you and if you don't, um, and, and then then you need to think about uh, other things, and I'll, which I'll get into. But basically, poor drainage is a failed rain garden. Again, we're not making a pond here. Um, if you don't have that kind of existing um, water percolation and infiltration into the soil and through the soil, then you need to really start thinking about subdrains and soil amendments. And this is one of those areas where, you know, this is a really important and really key component that we now have this amazing resource in the Rain Garden Manual to show us how to do these things. But I think we tend to um, do these by default um, on a lot of sites uh, because why bother testing uh, when you can just dig it out and put an amended soil there and set it and forget it and you don't have to think about it. Um, there are benefits to not messing with the native soil. Um, and why go to that extra work and effort if you don't need to, if you can do a simple test? So again, back to the turning pollution into a resource 
You know, we've got, you know, everybody's seen pictures of hydrocarbons on, on the asphalt. You know, it's rainwater gone bad. And, you know, if we can soak it into the ground before it gets there uh, and moves those hydrocarbons um, and picks up other, uh, other things, and maybe, maybe we can even, like, put a curb cut in so that it does pick up the hydrocarbon and then, then deposits, it, deposits it into a safe space instead of into our rivers. That would be great. But soak it into the ground. You know, a couple of key things to keep in mind. Minimize compaction when you're doing these rain gardens. When you're out there, if you've got heavy equipment, um, this will compact the soil and that will negatively impact your infiltration rates. Use existing native soils if they're going to do the job for you. And, and only put a subdrain if you need it. Because um, really, you know, so a subdrain is is basically a, 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 a perforated pipe in a, in, a, in a gravel trench at the bottom of your rain garden. So that the idea is that eventually all the water essentially goes into that drain and gets shuttled away. None of that water is recharging our groundwater. Um, it's capturing it before it recharges the groundwater. And recharging our groundwater keeps that, keeps that water from making our streams and rivers flashy. Um, it recharges the groundwater. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't do this um, if, if, if we don't need to. Um, otherwise, it's just extra engineering. So use native plants with deep-rooted systems. They'll break through those, those soils. Um, and water movement through the soil um, is, filtr is filtration. So this is water movement through a dry soil, through non-saturated soil. And this is kind of a, a key thing um, to keep in mind when we talk about infiltrating water into the soil. We don't want it going directly into the groundwater table. Um, if you dig a perk test and you find that your groundwater is at six inches or even 12 inches and you put a rain garden there, you're basically skipping the filtration that the soil does. Um, this is how all septic systems work. They, trickle the water through the soil, and that's what cleans it up. But if you put a septic system directly into groundwater, that waste is going straight into our groundwater. So it's the same thing with the rain garden. Um, if you live in a place that has high groundwater, then that is not a good location for a rain garden. Again, no fertilizers needed. Fertilizers are not needed for native plants. Um, put a border on it, make it clear and obvious, it can be really fancy or it can be really simple. But that really helps that intentionality and it just makes management a lot easier. When thinking about plant stock, I like to use the biggest stock we can get because these rain gardens are, can be kind of harsh environments. So if you've got good, large plant stock available to you, take advantage of it. Um, it can be difficult to find and it can be more costly, however. Plug plant stock is great, especially if you can get good quality plug plant stock. As I mentioned, it, you, it's good to hardy it um, so that you know it'll have the best benefit for success. Um, it will rapidly establish, um, and you can get a lot more diversity in there fairly quickly with plugs, um, fairly economical. But think about keeping your garden offline for a couple months until it's established. And this is another kind of important thing with any kind of stormwater management practice. If you're trying to get plants established in there, don't put the deluge of water in it right away. Keep it, keep it offline until your plants are established. There's no reason that you need to send that water in there right, right off the bat. And that'll go a long ways to helping your, your plants um, establish well. A lot of, you know, seed stock, a lot of rain gardens are fairly small for using seed stock. But um, you can get an amazing amount of diversity at a fairly low cost. Um, you do, however, have to deal with a higher initial maintenance, um, really essentially keeping it mowed um, while, those, while those seedlings get established. Um, this is slower to establish, and it requires more patience. Uh, but again, you, know, you can get a, a, a seed mix for a 500 square feet, which is probably, you know, a typical rain, you know, more than a typical rain garden size, 
for 42 bucks, you've got 43 different species in there. Um, and, and that's, you know, so you can get a really nice diversity fairly, fairly quickly and easily. And, and while, you know, um, coming from my background, what I like to do is put as much of every kind of plant or seed in there that I can think of and let uh, nature kind of sort it out, if you will. Um, and then these plants, and it's amazing, even in a 200 square foot area, I'll have, you know, one year the anise hyssop will just be going nuts. And the next year I won't see it, but then I'll have sky blue aster all over one side. And then the, then the following year sneezeweed is jumping. And just having that diversity just allows for that kind of dynamic ecological system to, to happen, which for me is super exciting. Weed ID can be difficult. That's, that's the, probably the biggest um, problem with using seed because um, you've got all these little, you know, cotyledons coming up and you're like, well, I think that, and you start pulling them all and then you miss one and you realize that's bone set later on down the road. So it can be a problem, and I recognize this. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do when you're using seed is to put a cover crop um, of, of oats, you know, seed oats work well, or winter wheat, um, and, and instead of mulching. Of course, you don't want to mulch something that you've seeded because it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, smother the seeds. But if you put a cover crop in, that will kind of help suppress a lot of the weeds and then essentially just keep it, keep it, keep it offline for the first season to allow some, these, these uh, plants to establish. Keep it mowed at a, you know, at a, at, you know about f four, to, four to six inches and it'll create a dynamic ecological area. But really, you know, a combination of plants and seeds is a good way to go. Um, again, the seed is so cheap that you really can put a whole bunch of diversity in there for easily. And then, and then put some plugs, maybe, maybe do the, uh, you know, the plants and that kind of structural, um, uh, you know, design, and then put seed in between and let that be your matrix. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of ways to go about it. Um, so really, that's that's pretty much um, that's m my presentation. And uh, you know, again, these rain gardens don't don't overcomplicate it. Um, it's it's uh, you know, if you understand some of the basics, you can take advantage of that water and really make a nice, diverse ecological area.